you believe that? Because I've seen him in my life many times just like that. Just like that. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Romans with me in chapter number 6. The book of Romans in chapter number 6 will be our text this morning. Romans and chapter number 6. There is so much doctrinal, uh, biblical truth for the church age, saint, and child of God throughout the 13 chapters of the book of Romans. If you have personally never read the book of Romans before, I would highly, highly encourage you to take time and do so. Uh, For those of us that are saved and in this church age of grace, it is so highly important for you and I, jam-packed with such doctrinal truth, not only uh, dealing with justification, uh, but also dealing with personal sanctification and how to live the Christian life to the fullest for the glory of God. Romans chapter number 6, I want to preach a real practical message to you this morning uh, that's going to deal with one of the greatest problems. Uh, Let me back up and say like this. It is the greatest problem that plagues every one of us this morning. The problem that I'll be dealing with and then the solution for it Uh, found in Romans chapter 6 is the greatest problem that plagues every Christian from the Christian that's preaching to you this morning to the Christians that sit next to you this morning. This is the greatest battle uh, of the Christian experience and the Christian life. Romans chapter 6 verse number 1 Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we, talking about saved people, shall, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Grace does not give us license to sin. Grace gives us the life and liberty to not sin this morning. Uh, come all the way down to verse number 6. He said, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. You've never seen a dead man in your life lust or covet or lie or cheat or steal or take God's name in vain. You never seen a dead man do that. He's dead. He can't do nothing. Uh, he says this, verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, the next three verses are highly important to the message this morning. Verses 11, 12, and 13, very highly important to the message. Uh, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Pray with me and for me if you would this morning. Lord, uh, we need an outpouring of your spirit. God, I pray this morning that you may feel not only the preacher, but God, I pray that you would anoint and feel the listeners this morning. Help us to hear what the spirit would say unto the church. God, I thank you so much for the good, sweet things our ears have heard and our hearts have experienced up to this point in the service. God, it's been real good to fellowship with your people. It's been even better to fellowship with the Spirit of God and to feel that sweet move and touch of the Holy Ghost in this place this morning. Thank you for each and every congregational song and each and every special song this morning. And now I pray for the preaching that you would help me. God, I need you and I can't do this without you. I pray you'd highlight this truth. Make it so big that when we walk out of here, we wouldn't leave it at 
the church house, but God, we'd take it with us into our daily lives, everywhere we go. I pray this, I pray this message this morning, Lord, would be a turning point in many of our lives. May it be a pivot point in our life to where we pivot from some things and pivot unto some things. God, I pray when we walk out of here, we'll walk out with a renewed sense of uh, vigor, a new renewed sense of uh, encouragement to try and live for God more effectively in 2020 than we ever have in years prior. Well, thank you for what you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There, there are two chapters that Paul is going to use here back to back that illustrates this great struggle of the Christian life. We don't have time to read all of chapter 6 and we certainly don't have time to go to chapter 7 and preach all that too. But if you used to read chapter 6 and chapter 7, you'll find that Paul uses two chapters back to back to highlight this great Christian struggle, this great Christian battle. You say, preacher, I know the greatest battle that I have in my life. The greatest enemy that I have in my life is the devil. Can I say that's not true? I will say there is nobody that hates you anymore in this world than the devil, but the devil is not the biggest source of hindrance in anybody in this room's life from the pulpit to the pew. I believe the devil does hinder. I believe the devil does try and sidetrack us. I believe the devil does try and draw us away, entice us in our lusts and mess us up. But the truth is tonight, many things we, many things we blame the devil for, he didn't do. Uh, many times we blame the devil for a lot of stuff and he gets credit for things that he didn't even have nothing to do with this morning. You say, no preacher, I know the biggest struggle that I have and I know the biggest enemy I got. It's that world out there. Preacher, that world out there. And you know, we talk about the world a lot. And brother, that world and that world this and that world that. And it's them worldly people and it's them worldly uh, influences and it's them worldly voices and it's them worldly pictures and it's the world. And, and the truth is the Christian does fight the world. There's no doubt about that this morning. Every day you get up, you live in the world, but you're not of the world. But listen to me. The greatest enemy you have is that person that you look at in the mirror every single day. The greatest enemy in the biggest battle, y'all understand this, the biggest battle of the Christian life will be with your own flesh this morning. Now I realize, I realize nobody likes to hear that. You know why nobody likes to hear that? Because we like ourselves. <laughs> nobody likes to hear that your biggest problem is you, ma'am. Nobody likes to hear that your biggest problem is you, sir. You know, like we like to do, if we do finally cut it down, Brother John, to where it gets close to our flesh, we say, well, it's not my flesh, it's that woman I'm married to in her flesh. She's the problem. Woo! Yeah, I noticed a single guy up there hollered when I said that. None of you married men said anything. <laughs> Lord, I know the biggest problem. It's that good-for-nothing skunk of a chauvinistic pig that you made me be married to that's sloppy and never says thank you and don't hold the door up. He's the biggest problem in my life. That ain't true. Sister, the biggest problem you got is you. And brother, the biggest problem you got is you. And young people, the biggest problem y'all got is you this morning. It ain't your parents, it ain't your schoolmates, it ain't your co-workers. The biggest problem every Christian has that will hinder, sidetrack, and mess them up more than anything else is your own flesh. Now I'll say this, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that the devil and the world will use your flesh against you. You, you know what you have? You know what every Christian has? They have the proverbial Trojan horse. You are the Trojan horse. The devil will try and use you to infect you against yourself this morning. Uh, the devil's got an inside man in the job. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I mean, if you're saved, you have an old man. You have an old woman. There's an old man or an old woman, this old flesh, that's still living and breathing, but it wants to take over and absolutely rule your life. But if you're saved, you have a new man that has been created in righteousness and holiness after the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man right here wants to live for God and serve God. He wants to pray. He wants to read his Bible. 
Bible. He wants to witness. He wants to love. He, he wants to have charity. He, he wants to have hope. He wants to have joy. He wants to have peace. He wants to have a holy life and the Holy Ghost. And these two people are in the same body and they're fighting against each other all the time. Every Christian that's saved is a sure enough, true to life, schizophrenic. <laughs> you didn't know that you was a schizo this morning, did you? But you are. If you're saved by the grace of God, you've got two natures. Before you got saved, you only had one nature. That's why sinners act like sinners. They got no choice to act like sinners. Stop getting mad at sinners when they act like sinners. They act like sinners because that's the only way they can act this morning. But a child of God that's been saved doesn't have to act like that no more. Doesn't have to live like that no more. He's got a new nature that moved inside of his life when he got saved. Paul said this. Paul said this about this flesh. He said, in my flesh. I'm talking about the apostle Paul that wrote Romans, 1 St. Corinthians, uh, brother Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews. I'm talking about a fellow that wrote a big part of your New Testament. That guy right there said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, I'm just going to be real transparent with y'all. If a fella of the caliber of the Apostle Paul said, in his flesh dwells no good thing, <laughs> you're looking at one messed up dude preaching to you this morning. I ain't even talking about y'all. I'm talking about the fella that y'all got as a pastor. He's a messed up dude. There's nothing in my flesh that's any good. It's rotten to the core. It's bu -bu 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 bad, bu -bu bad to the bu -bu bone this morning, brother. Paul said this. Paul said, we put no confidence in the flesh. I don't trust me as far as I can pick me up and chunk me across this platform this morning. You can't be trusted. Say, preacher, are you talking mighty ugly about me? Well, I'm talking about you like the Lord talks about you this morning, friend. As a matter of fact, the biggest sins that John highlights are all sins of the flesh. Lust, 1 John, read it for yourself, 1 John chapter 2. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You know what all those sins are? They're sins of your own flesh. Do you realize if you read the Ten Commandments that eight of the Ten Commandments are all flesh sins that the Bible deals with? Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. How do you do that? You do it with your tongue. Don't covet. How do you do that? You do it with your eyes. Don't steal. How do you do that? You do it with your hands. Don't bear false witness. How do you do that? You do it with your mouth. Don't commit adultery. How do you do that? You do it with your body. I mean, brother, all the eight of the Ten Commandments are all flesh related. Do you think God knows something about us this morning? <laughs> And he does. He knows a lot about us this morning. Now I'm going to show you a few things here on the way into the message. I got a long introduction and uh, not quite as long a message, but I got, I, I'm going to preach to you now this morning just for a few minutes, okay? I mean, I ain't going to keep you here till 1 o'clock. We ain't going to be like a Zion AME church this morning or nothing like that. Like, you know, get out at 2 o'clock or nothing. But look here. I, just give me a couple minutes, all right? Give it till about 1230. Could you do that for me? We ain't having church tonight. I didn't even get to teach Sunday school. So that's 45 minutes of what I normally get to ramble on. I didn't even get to ramble. And another 45 minutes tonight, I ain't even going to get a chance to. So I'm getting one 45 minute shot at you. Just give me a break, all right? My wife, if you, listen, y'all, if not for yourself or for me, do it for my wife. Because if y'all don't let me go for a little extra longer this morning, she'll have to hear it at the house. And she don't want to have to hear none of that garbage. So just give me, just give me some grace this morning, okay? Just hang with me here for just a minute and I'm going to be done. I mean, Paul talks about this flesh business. All down through here, he's saying, we're supposed to be dead to sin, alive to God. Dead to sin, alive to God. I've told you this illustration before, but it's so good, i got to tell you again. Uh, Paul was from a place called Tarsus. Brother Fred, we know that Paul, his name was Saul. And he was called Saul of Tarsus this morning. And they said they had a real unique way of putting capital offenders to death in Tarsus. They said, Brother File, the way that they killed people that were murderers is they wouldn't just simply execute them by cutting their heads off or, or, or hanging them or whatever. They said that the way they would kill a capital offender that had murdered somebody is when they found out he was guilty, they would take the dead body of the individual that he had killed. They would take that dead body that had been murdered and they would take that dead carcass and they would strap it to the back 
of the living man. And they would lock them in the cell together, the living man and the dead man. And they would strap him to his back and they would make him carry him around on his back until finally the infection and the rigor mortis and all of the disease of the dead man set in on the living man. And so the dead guy ended up killing the living guy this morning. You know what Paul says in chapter 7? I don't have time to go to chapter 7, but if you used to read it, Paul's dealing with this whole struggle. And Paul finally gets down to the end dealing with his struggle, and he says this. He says, Brother Bill, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul says, I'm trying to live for God. The things that I would do, those are the things I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, them's the things I find myself doing. He said, I'm walking around daily and I got this corpse strapped to my back. And this corpse that I got, it says, I want, I need, I got to have. Look at this. Say that. Do this. Listen to that. Wear this. Go there. I mean, he's constantly. You know what? What the flesh is the flesh is like the flesh is like a wild young this morning that's what the flesh is like an unrestrained young you ever got in a car with a young and I've got four of them brother you ever had I mean we've had four toddlers at one time and brother Keith we'd be riding down the road and they're constantly mama I want this daddy are we there yet let's stop touching me leave me alone make them do this make them do that can't we get out I want to go there can we stop here that's a classic picture of the flesh. That's your flesh this morning. It constantly says, give me. It constantly says, you need this. You need that. Do this. Do that. You know what I want to say every once in a while? Just shut up. Shut up, flesh. You dead. But I'm not dead. I'm talking to you. Yeah, and then I get freaked out that I start talking to myself. The Bible said we are to do something in the text. Paul gives us three requirements here real quickly on the way into the message. Paul gives us three requirements for living above the flesh and above the lusts of the flesh. It is possible to live. Uh, I'm not saying it's possible to live sinless. But what I'm trying to give you this morning is it is possible to sin less. We are, let me stop right there and say this. We are living in a society of a church world that, that tries to make out, that it almost makes it out like this. Well, it, we're all just sinners and it's okay. And just, you know, it just is what it is. We, we are living in a day of lasciviousness where people presume on the grace of God just because they can this morning. What's wrong with trying to live away from sin? What's wrong with trying to get your mind right and your heart right and your mouth right? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong with that. And you can if you want to this morning. Here, here he shows us three requirements on the way into the message. My message is in verse 13. We'll work our way down there. He says, if, if you're going to live above these things, you've you got to have a reckoning. There's got to be some reckoning involved. Look what he said in verse 11. Got to be some reckoning involved. Verse 11, likewise reckon. I like that. Paul was a southerner, obviously. And there's no doubt he was. He was from Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, which is one of the southern tribes. I like Paul. He's a southerner. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He uses that word reckon. Matter of fact, Paul uses the word reckon more than anybody in the Bible. That word reckon is an accounting term. Uh, it, it, it's a term of, of accounting this morning uh, that, that means that, that you have set something to be so. You may not see it. You may not be able to lay hands on it. But you trust that it's so because the facts say it so this morning. That's, you, you say, what, what's reckoning? Reckoning is like what they do up at the bank this morning. Uh, we, we got so much going on now, cashless society, cashless. But I got an EBT card, or not EBT, what do you call it? Um, um, ATM card, not EBT. EBT is what they give out for welfare, isn't it? I don't got an EBT card. I got, I, I was finna say I got an ABC card. I ain't got one of them neither. I don't go to the ABC store. I got, I got an ATM card is what I got. And that ATM card, my bank card, debit card, I've got that card and I go somewhere and I know I've already checked my balance. I check my balance and I know for a fact, Brother Charlie, that when I check my balance, my bank account said you got 
$150 in your checking account. Okay, so then when I pull up at the gas station and I pull that card out of my pocket and I stick that thing in that reader and pull it back out and I'm going to give me $55 worth of gas, I have reckoned the fact that there is enough money in the account to cover what I'm fixing to buy. <laughs> Some of us have lived dangerously and we've put 55 in, no, we didn't have a 56 in the account. <laughs> Amen. We're living on the edge. And sometimes we thought we was going to get $50 worth of gas, but it only let us get $37. And then it finally said, that's all we're going to give you. You cut off right there. Uh, we've been there before too. Somebody say amen that's lived with me before. Anyway, and so what you are doing is you are reckoning something to be so. Not because I had $150 in my pocket, but because, Brother Matt, I know what the account said. Now this morning, Paul said you got to reckon. You say, what are we reckoning? You are reckoning yourself dead to sin, alive to God. Can I say this morning, even though you don't feel like you're dead, nobody in here feels like you're dead. I mean, I know sometimes you get tired and you say, I feel half dead, but you ain't dead. You talking, you breathing, you living, you walking. Here you sat this morning. Is anybody dead in here? Okay, good. I'm not to call the ambulance on nobody. Everybody's all right. You still with me? You may be dead in 30 more minutes, but you ain't dead right now. And so uh, here we said, but the truth is, if you're saved by the grace of God, the Bible said you are dead this morning. You may not feel like it, but the fact says you are. The Bible said this. The Bible said, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, dead. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here in the text, as a matter of fact, he gives one of them reckoning terms. In verse number 6, he says, verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. But I ain't crucified. Brother Mikey, here I am. I ain't on a cross. Here I am. But the Bible said I am to reckon myself to be on a cross and dead to sin. And a dead man on a cross, uh, he can't do nothing for himself. His hands are nailed. His feet's nailed. He's dead. He can't do nothing for himself. And even though I'm still living and breathing, I am to rely on what the fact of the Word of God said that I am dead with Christ but I'm not just dead with Christ look at what else you're supposed to reckon you're supposed to reckon in verse 11 that I'm dead to sin but alive unto God I'm dead that way but I'm alive this way this morning some of y'all walked in here feeling Lord in a snake's belly in a wagon rut and you come in and say preacher I'm not even worthy to pray. I'm not even worthy to call on God's name and enter into the throne room of heaven and go before the throne of grace. But you are this morning. You know how I know you are? Because the facts said that you're worthy and you are alive to be able to do so this morning. You might have walked in here this morning. You say, preacher, I just can't live the Christian life. I can't. You're right. On your own, you can. But the facts said God's give you the power and the ability to be able to do so if you want to this morning. You have to reckon these things because God said so. You know the problem with many American Christians? They rely too much on feeling and not near enough on fact. As a matter of fact, we have everything out of whack. Here we are this morning. We're in the middle of COVID and we have found out how many people are relying on feeling instead of faith this morning. I mean, brother, we're living in one of those faithless, obviously, generations we've ever seen. Look here, there are some people that are totally healthy in their body. They ain't sick this morning. They're not going on vacation somewhere this morning. They just made their mind up, I'm scared about coming. And because I'm a little scared about coming, I'm just, I'm going to stay out for a month, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. You know what that tells me? Listen to what that tells me. Let me pause here and say this. If sure enough, true to life persecution ever comes in America and they literally start sending troops or, or paramilitary or the UN to our church doors and say because your preacher preaches out of that Bible, it's homophobic, that Bible's misogynistic, that Bible's some sort of racist hate literature and he can't preach out of it and we're shutting y'all down and revoking y'all's tax exempt status. You know what this tells me? That there's a whole lot of people that'll just go to the house and say, well, I'll just watch the preacher on Facebook and they're going to leave the preacher right by himself to go to prison. Come on now, come on now. Look here, if, a, if an unseen virus scares you that bad that you never come back, I promise you somebody with an AK-47 AR-15 showing up at the door 
saying we're going to lock all y'all up, that'll scare some of them bad enough they will never be back. We're living in this generation of fact, Faith, fear, feelings. What, what's, what's the proper order? Here's the proper order. Always in your Bible, here's the proper order. Fact first, faith second, feelings last. You know what we've done today? We've put feelings first, faith second, and fact last. That is not the way it's supposed to be. We are to put our faith in the fact of the Word of God and how I feel about it don't add up to diddly squat this morning, friend. My job is just to reckon it to be so. Say, preacher, how can I beat this battle of the flesh? you got to have a reckoning. Not only is there a reckoning, but then there's a reigning. There's a reigning. Look at what it said in verse 12. Verse 12, there's a reigning. I ain't even give you the title of my message yet. But I told you we'll be done at 1230. That's in 25 minutes. Hang on just a minute. We're rolling there. There's a reigning. Look what it said, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. He not only says there must be a reckoning if you're going to fight the flesh, there must be a reigning if you're going to fight the flesh. Do you understand something this morning? Somebody is reigning your life. That word reign, we don't understand it much today. Uh, you could use the term ruling, I guess. That term, we don't understand it much today because Americans have never had a king. The last king we had was in the 1770s, and we got tired of old King George, and so we give him the boot, and man, here we are today. Signed the Declaration of Independence, and thank God for it. Throwed his tea off into the, into, the, into the river, amen. And here we sit in the harbor, and here we are today. Glory to God for all that stuff. I'm American, top of my head to bottom of my feet. But a real sure enough reign means somebody calls all the shots in your life. A real king, he has absolute authority and control to do whatever he wants to in your life. He can get just as deep in your life and in your business as he wants to, and he ain't got to ask you for nothing. Now listen to what I'm telling you. You're sitting here this morning, but everybody in here is being reigned and ruled by somebody. Either you are being reigned and ruled by your flesh, yourself, or you are being reigned and ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not both. There is no such thing as a split rulership in the life of the child of God. Either you're reigning or Jesus is reigning. Either sin is reigning or the Savior is reigning. Either the flesh is ruling and reigning or Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Somebody made this statement. I read it the other day. Great statement. I'm talking about great statement this morning, Brother Leonard. This is what they said. They said, in the heart, in the heart of every Christian, there is a throne and a cross. And if you are on the throne, Jesus is on the cross. But if Jesus is on the throne, you're on the cross. Amen. That's the key to living the Christian life right there. Get off of his throne and get back on your cross. You know the problem with a lot of Christians? They want to get off the cross and start living themselves. I'm going to live this life. And they crucify Jesus open and afresh and stick him on the cross. And they sit down on the throne and say, I'm going to rule and reign my life. That is not the way to live the Christian life. If you're going to have victory over sin and over self and over Satan, the way you've got to do it is crucify yourself daily and keep Jesus Christ on the throne of rulership this morning. Listen to me, listen to me. You will, y'all, you won't get rid of sin until the day that you die. Sorry to tell you, every one of us are going to have a battle with our flesh and sin till we die. But Brother Gary, just because I battle sin till the day that I die, that doesn't mean that I have to let sin be in charge and reign over my life. Look, I'm on, I, I, I'm on trip, I'm on stumble, I'm on fall, I'm on mess up. But that doesn't mean that I let sin sit on the throne and dictate my life. No, I may have a, a run-in with him from time to time. But by and large, I'm going to try and keep sin and self off the throne and keep him on the cross and keep Jesus on the throne of my heart. Here's the message. There's a reckoning, there's a reigning. Lastly, we find there's a relinquishing. Look at this relinquishing. I'm going to give you my title, give you 20 minutes, and go to the house. Look at this relinquishing, verse 13. Watch what he said. If you're, going, if you're going to win this struggle, there's not only must be a reckoning and a reigning, there must be a relinquishing. Verse 13. 
neither yield. Yield. That word yield shows up twice here. It means to relinquish. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of unrighteousness un, uh, uh, instruments of righteousness unto God. There must not only be a reckoning and a reigning, but then there must be a relinquishing this morning. He says twice to yield yourself. Yield yourself. That word yield, the word yield means to, it means to place a person or a thing at someone else's disposal. He said you are to place your members. Did you see what he said? Notice the wording because it's really important to the message here. He said neither yield ye your Members, members, he's talking about your body parts, your members. You, you're one body, but you got a lot of members. You got eyes, mouth, tongue, ears, you know, brain, heart, hands, feet. You, you got a lot of members, but it's one body. And watch what he says about your body here. Watch this relinquishing. Neither yield ye your members as instruments. I seen that some time ago. I never preached a message on it until this morning. I like this. As instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God. And he said your members as instruments of righteousness unto God this morning. Do, do, do you know what that piano is? That piano is an instrument. And do you know what this piano is? This piano is totally yielded to whoever plays it. It, it don't play on its own. It only puts out what somebody tells it to. It only puts out what an individual can sit. Y'all think I'm fitting to play, don't you? Y'all sat there and thought, Brother Zong can play the piano. He fit to play. No. How y'all like that? Ain't that great? That's as good as I can do. Because that's, I, it, it is yielded. Y'all, I didn't sit down here and all of a sudden this piano just starts saying, you know, great balls of fire and, and just running up and down. I don't even know how the clutch works on this thing, man. I can't even get it in gear to make it go. I ain't got a clue. It's yielded to this bozo sitting behind it. But you put Miss Katina on it or you put Miss Esther on it, you know what all of a sudden it does? It, it yields itself to their magic. And, and they make something come out of it this morning. It is an instrument but the instrument is only yielded at the disposal of the person that plays it. This instrument will not play without somebody playing it this morning. And Paul says this about everybody's life in here. Your life is an instrument. Your body is an instrument. And somebody is playing everybody in here. You heard the term, you're getting played. You're getting played. Somebody, they playing you. Yeah. Everybody in here is getting played by somebody. Either you are the one playing your life or the Lord Jesus Christ is the one playing your life. Everybody, listen to what I'm telling you. Everybody's life in here is making some kind of tune. Everybody's life is making some kind of tune. I just wonder what kind of tune your life is making. That's what I'm going to preach here for about 20 minutes and I'm going to be done. I'm preaching on what type of tune is your life playing? What type of tune is your life playing? I mean, if you're the one at the control of your keys, then brother, you're playing a messed up tune. But brother, if Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, is at the keys of your life, He's playing something that gives God glory. Amen. Yield yourselves as instruments of righteousness unto God or either you're yielding yourself as an instrument of sin unto unrighteousness. What type of tune is your life playing? Number one, some people's life plays the blues of sin. Some people are playing the tune of the blues of sin. So I really wanted to sing a bunch of lines from songs this morning, but I thought my wife wouldn't like it, so I ain't going to do it, praise God. 
Some people's life just plays the blues of sin. That's the tune. Every time you get, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Every time you get around some people or every time you read their posts on Facebook, you know what it is? It's just that sad old song of the blues. I mean, brother, some people, every time you get around them, brother Zach, I mean, the tune's always the same. It's always somebody did me wrong. I don't like what so-and-so did. Well, my life's been bad. Well, it's all down dirty it's all in the dumps I mean some people's life their life just plays the blues all the time and listen to what I'm fixing to tell you if you let the devil yoke up with your flesh he will play the same old sad tunes over and over and over and over I mean he'll just keep in them same old sad blues tunes and you'll walk around with your lip dragging the ground you'll walk around defeated you'll walk around feeling like you ain't got no victory y'all listen to me, I refuse to let my life be a jukebox of the devil. I refuse to let my life be a jukebox for somebody pushing the buttons and keeping me down in the doldrums of sin. I refuse to be his little playlist to be able to hit any time he wants to play something in my life. I've made my mind up that the sounds that come out of my life are going to be praise unto God. He deserves it. He bought me, he paid for me, and I want the tune of my life to be praised unto God this morning. Some people's tune is the blues of sin. Some people's tune, and I'm talking about Christians, is the beats of sin. Not just the blues of sin. Some people's tune is the beats of sin. Some saints, some saints their tune. I'm talking about what their life is producing. When you look at their life and what their life is, man, every part of their life, it's the same tune as the world this morning. Some, some saints, some saints, you look at their life and they confuse me whether they even saved or not. They claim to be saved. They say they saved. But the tune their life is playing, you know what the tune their life's playing is? The tune their life's playing is, I'm on a highway to hell. That's the tune some people's life plays right there. Some of y'all this morning, I'm telling you, you've known some Christians, supposed Christians. You look at their life, and man, their life is just playing the most demonic stuff you've ever seen in your day. I'm not just talking about the literal music they're playing. I'm talking about what the tune their life says this morning. I heard a fellow say one time, an old preacher from years and years ago, back during like Billy Sunday days, they said that he was, going, he was preaching a revival meeting, and he said on the last night of that meeting, I'm going to preach on why I know I'm not going to hell. Why I know I'm not going to hell. And that place packed out and people showed up. And everybody crowded in there to hear that fellow say why he knew he wasn't going to hell. And they said that old boy got up and this is all he said. And when he said this, it got real quiet. And hundreds of people ended up getting born again based off this one thing that he said. He got up and looked around. Everybody's waiting to hear why I'm not going to hell. He stood up and said, ladies and gentlemen, you've showed up to hear why I know I'm not going to hell. And everybody kind of sat there and leaned in. He said this. He said, I know I'm not going to hell because I'm not headed that direction. Son, that's deeper than you think it is. I ain't even going that way. Brother, I ain't walking that way. I'm on a whole different path. I'm on a whole different destination and different journey this morning. I ain't walking on a one-way path, big path to headed to hell with everybody else. I'm a walking hand in hand with Jesus. Uh, I ain't walking to the beat of this world. Uh, I ain't walking to the drum of this world. Uh, no child, look here. No child of God should be like not just the rock and roll mindset. No child of God's life. No child of God's life should be like the country music mindset either. I've lost my dog and I've lost my, you know, my truck and I lost my wife. And dear God, that's depressing. They lost everything. You know the thing about country music, I'll be honest with you. If I was to let my flesh just go, if I was to let my flesh just go, there's two types of music that my flesh likes. Talk about Cody's orange flesh. Close your ears, Tristan. I know you hate it when I talk about stuff like this. There's two types of music that Cody's orange flesh absolutely loves. One is old school southern rock and roll. Leonard Skinner, CCR. I mean, that stuff, that's real talent. That's real talent. They all lost and wicked and they all went to hell. But that's what my flesh likes. And if I, if I let my flesh go, brother, that's where it'd run to. I ain't going to let her go. I'm going to rein it in. That ain't ungodly about none of that stuff. 
Oh, wicked as hell. It is for him. And the other is just plain old country music from the 80s and 90s. I mean, you know, George Strait and Garth Brooks and, you know, Waylon and, you know, Willie and all them guys. That, that's, where, that's where I'd run to. If I let my flesh go, that's right where it'll run to. You, know, I, you say, is that what you got on your playlist? No. Why? Because my flesh likes it. You say, well, don't you give your flesh what you like? You're not supposed to. Supposed to deny that flesh. That's what bearing the cross is about. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Some Christians don't deny themselves nothing. Anything they want, they just go right after it. Anyways, I had a point where I was going with that. You know something about that kind of music right there, though? Especially that country music style stuff. You know what it is? I've listened to enough of it. I know, friend. It's got the idea, Brother John, that you can reach out and hold hands with the world and drink, and drink beer and drink liquor on the weekends and party and fornicate and commit adultery and have yourself a time. And then right in the middle of a song where it talks about some dude committing fornication, where it talks about some girl out drinking liquor and partying, right in the same song it'll turn around and talk about how much they love Jesus and how much they love God and how mama raised them in church. That's an abomination unto God this morning. Look here, that mindset is so anti-biblical and anti-God. If you're going to live the Christian life correctly, you can't hold this and hold that too and say, well, I, I'm a party girl on the weekends, but on Sunday I like to put my dress on and live for Jesus. Well, I like to party like the boys on the weekend and pop back, you know, a Miller High Life and a Budweiser, but on Sunday I like to put my tie on and go to church. That is not Bible. That is not living for God. If you're going to live the the Christian life, there's got to be a forsaking of some things and a fleeing to some things this morning. I mean, what kind of tune is your life playing? If we was to play the tune of your life, what's it sound like? Is it the beats of sin? Is it the blues of the world? Or lastly, I'm done. Does your life's tune play the beauty of the Savior? <laughs> Does it play the beauty of the Savior? Y'all listen to me. If you are saved, your body is His instrument. I read it to you. Romans 6, 13. Your body, it's His instrument. If your body is His instrument, is He getting to play anything out of you? Are you bringing forth any kind of glory unto Him this morning? Just the other day, talking about this kind of thing, talking about being able to hold the world's hand and hold the Lord's hand and run with both of them and all that. Just yesterday, I was sitting on the sofa and uh, I, I had the TV on and I saw Gaither Gospel Hour was coming up. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to just, I like to listen to gospel music. So I said, I'm going to listen to these fellas and see what they got going on. And all of a sudden it popped on and Brother Cliff, it was, you know, which most of them ain't no better than this dude anyway, but it, it was Alan Jackson. And I thought, well, you know, old Alan, he can sing. And I enjoyed listening to him sing the hymns. But I sit there and I'm watching this thing and I'm thinking to myself, I can't even take him serious. I can't take him serious because I know that ain't who he is. He's a fake. He's, that ain't who he is. That ain't what he is. I know what Alan Jackson is. And that ain't it. And he even stood up there, and this is what he said. He said, my mama's been after me for years. And they showed his mama sitting over there. He said, he's been after me for years to make a gospel album. Well, here it is. Well, good for you. Glory to God. But you're fixing to run right back out of there, go pop a top on some, and then go sing songs that encourage living like the devil. I can't take your song serious when you're singing, I come to the garden alone. While the, I, can't, I can't take it serious when I know here in just a little while you're going to be out there singing a whole different tune. I can't take it serious. And listen to what I'm telling you. I'm not talking about now music. I'm talking about your life. I cannot take your Christian life serious when one instant you're playing the world stuff through your life. Your life is giving testimony that you don't know God and you don't care. And then the next instant you're acting like, oh, I love Jesus. I can't they take you serious. I know this ain't popular preaching, but by God Almighty, that's good even if I am doing it this morning. 
I'm talking about how to whip the flesh this morning, brother. My life is to play the beauty of the Savior. Listen to me. My life wasn't worth nothing, brother Mike Hyde, until Jesus grabbed the hold of it. My life played the sad old songs of the world. My life played the depressing tune of a boy going to hell that was religious but didn't know God. But happy day when the master instrument player reached down, grabbed my hand, and started playing a new song. That Bible said he's put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto my God. He put a new tune in me, friend. Heard the story one time. They said there was an auction going on in some estate. And this estate was selling all kinds of stuff off. And about that time, across the platform came this old, dusty, rusty violin. They opened the case up, showed the crowd this violin, didn't look like much, and the auctioneer said, who'll give me $20 for this violin? And nobody said nothing. He sat there, man, he said, fine. Who'll give me $10 for this violin? We need to sell it. Nobody said nothing. Brother Damien, they sat there and they said, who'll give me $5? For this violin. Nobody said anything. He finally said, Will anybody just make a bid of any sort? Just give me something so we can get rid of this thing. We need to get rid of all this junk. Somebody give me something. And about that time, an older gentleman in that big crowd stood up and he said, Sir, can I step up to the auction block for just a minute? And he said, Sure, come ahead. That old gentleman walked up and he said, Can I hold the violin? And that auctioneer handed it to him. He pulled it out. He began to wipe off the strings, all the strings up. He took the bow out that was rosin in the case. He rosined up the bow. He began to pluck on the strings and tune them as he would pluck on them to get them in tune. And that old man stepped up to the microphone and he put that neck of that violin up under his neck and he began to strike the bow across the chords and it began to make the most beautiful music that they'd ever heard. They said the man played so skillfully and so masterfully with that worthless violin that people literally began to cry. They was listening to such beautiful, heavenly music. The old man got done with his masterpiece, handed the violin back to the auctioneer and walked down. And the auctioneer stood up and said, 100, who'll give me $100 for this violin? Somebody said, I'll give you 100. Somebody else stood up and said, I'll give you 120. Somebody else said 125. Somebody else said 200. Somebody else, that fell ended up selling the violin for hundreds of dollars. And somebody walked up to the auctioneer when it was over and they said this, they said, sir, what made the difference? That violin, nobody would even give you a bid. It wasn't worth a dime. Uh, but then you ended up selling it for hundreds of dollars. What made the difference? He said the difference was the touch of the master's hand. It was the touch of the master that made all the difference. Uh, may I say this morning, I wasn't nothing but no worthless instrument. I wasn't fit for nothing but hell. But thank God I'm out here. One day the good God of glory laid his hand on my life, rosin me up, cleaned me up, and played a new tune out of my life this morning. I was shackled by a heavy burden underneath such a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same. Cause he touched me. Oh, God touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something wonderful happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. I like it so good, I'm going to sing another verse of it. Since I met this blessed Savior. Yeah. 
daily since he cleansed and made me whole. Well, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. You say, what kind of tune does your life play now? My life plays things like this. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. My life plays uh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. My life now plays uh, when peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my Lord has taught me to say, it's well, it's well with my soul. My life now plays wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saves Jesus saves and thank God I'm a singing today when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there thank God this morning the tune that's played in my life is different today than it used to be I preach today to your heart on what type of tune is your life making Say, preacher, I don't want to send mixed signals with my life. Good. Nobody in here that's a Christian should want to send mixed signals. There should be absolutely no gray area about where you stand or who you stand for. It should be an absolute, easy to read picture and an easy to read tune out of your life who you live for and who you don't live for this morning. Say, how do I do that? You're going to have to do some reckoning. You'll have to let him do the raining. And then the message this morning is you'll have to do some relinquishing. Help me, Esther, over here. I, wa- I wonder this morning who it is that's on the throne and who it is that's on the cross in your heart. It's, it, you, both, there, there's no such thing as a split rulership, y'all. Either Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning in your life and you have crucified yourself and you are on the cross. Or either it's the opposite. And you are sitting on the throne of your life and calling all the shots. And Jesus is on the cross. This morning, every child of God has two natures and a choice to make. Either I will give in to the Spirit of God and the new man and let Him rule my life. Or either I'm going to give in to the old man with the lust and the affections and the desires thereof. No child of God has to live his life under the boot and the bondage of sin. Y'all listen to me. If you sin this morning, I'm preaching to me too. I'm telling you, when I'm studying this, the Holy Ghost helped my heart. Help me with this personally as a Christian. If you sin, it is not because you have to. There is no temptation taking you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. If you sin, it is not because you have to. It is because you decided to. To say, to say, well, I had to do it. I couldn't help it. To say that is to spit in the face of the sacrifice of God. Because His sacrifice was enough to deliver you from the bondage of sin. I'm not saying this morning that you ain't never going to mess up, never going to sin. Brother, I mess up on a regular basis. But I like what Paul said, Brother John. He said, I die daily. You know what he meant by that? He meant, he meant this. Brother Hunter, Paul meant every day I get up, I crucify me afresh and anew. Every day I get up, I put Cody Zorn on the cross and make sure Jesus is on the throne. I wonder this morning, when's the last time you crucified the affections and the lusts of the flesh and even apologize, Lord, I'm sorry for idle words that I let come out that I knew was unpleasing. I let let sin reign in my body. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to. You're supposed to reign. This morning, I wonder if you would say, Lord, I want the tune coming out of my life, the instrument of my life. I want it to play that beautiful song of praise unto our God. Let's all stand this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder if you'd come. Father, I pray you'd use this simple little message from the Word of God.
God, it's simple. It, it, it is. It's so simple. Anybody can get a hold of it. But God, it is so very deep and needed. It, it, it is one of the absolute keys of living victorious Christian life. God, help us to grab a hold of this truth. Help us to grab a hold of this thing. And Lord, start trying with everything inside of us to make sure that you are reigning and ruling and we are relinquishing the command of our life to you and to no other. Help us, dear God, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come, you come. Sister, sing. You don't know where I have come from And you don't know where I have been The burden I carried was heavy and I had no peace left within the path that I traveled was hopeless many times I just lost my way and Satan would whisper there's no way out and he told me that too far I'd strayed But that was before Jesus stepped in He raced all my past and cleansed all my sins He broke the chains that once held me down He set me free and I'm no longer bound I was past hope, but that was before Jesus stepped in. Friend, do you find yourself hopeless? Does doubt and despair seem your God? Remember that Jesus still loves you. He wants to walk by your side His love and His grace reaches deeper Than the pit of despair you are in I know cause I've been where you are now And I've questioned if there was an end but that was before Jesus stepped in He raced all my past and cleansed all my sins He broke the chains that once held me down He set me free and I'm no longer bound I was past hope but that was before Jesus stepped in. Sing this with me this morning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a church i really really appreciate you being here i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming and being in the service this morning those of you that are watching and are sick this morning or out of town 
please know we love you. We're praying for you. Amen. And um, brother, would y'all couple of y'all hold them in the back for me if you don't mind? One more thing. One more thing before we go. I have forgot the last how many services? Two services? Three services? I forgot a lot of services. This young man keeps coming up to me in every service saying, you forgot to let me say my verse. You forgot to let me say my verse. And you're right, I have. But no longer because Brother Michael Holsauser is good at helping me remember. Come on up here, Tatum. Let's hear that thing. Hey. <coughs> I'm telling you, I, I, I love to hear it almost more than anything. I love to hear young people quote Bible. So this young man, step on up here so everybody can see you real good. Looking sharp this morning. Yeah, mama did good. Slicked that hair up. Son, I'm telling you, that's bulletproof right there. I mean, I think this kid could take a bullet to the head and it'd bounce off right now. Praise God. Looking good. Dad's a barber too. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Daddy can cut hair. All right, you ready? Let her rip. Even a child is known by his doings. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11. First Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. First Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Yeah. Isn't that good? I'm, I'm telling y'all wouldn't take a gold nickel for that right there. I love to hear that stuff. Yes, sir. All that King James is too hard to understand. People can't, people can't quote it. It's too tough for them kids. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. All right, let's close in a good word of prayer this morning. Brother, it's good to have you. Tell me your name again. Brother Donald? Coker. Yeah, they visited with us this morning. We got some other folk visiting this morning, just moved into the area. They come all the way from Walla Walla, Washington. Praise God. And uh, that's, that, that's about as far as you can get from here, man. And so it's so good to have y'all this morning. Good to have you, brother. How about close us in a word of prayer, if you don't mind, brother? <laughs>